So I thought I would go into detail uh, on how we can use this uh, with an example uh, we have. So this was from a project we had at the Norwegian Computing Center together with the European Space Agency. And they asked us to actually to demonstrate deep learning for sat satellite images. So we had to, to find a, a good application, and we decided to try to make a forest map of Africa with the forest height. And in particular, they were interested in this region across the southern border of Sahara, called the Sahil region, because the desert Sahara is spreading every year uh, further south. So they're trying to plant the belt of forest across Africa, called the Great Green Wall <coughs> Initiative. And the and, uh, use case uh, we decided to look at was to see if we can make an uh, algorithm that can monitor this forest uh, using satellite images. So at the uh, southern border of Sahara, it's typically dry forest. So the input data in our machine learning setup would be satellite images. So this is the Sentinel-2 satellite. Uh, it takes optical images with the uh, different channels, uh, red, green, blue, infrared, and some more. And the ground truth data we collected using LiDAR scanning. So we had some data laying around from Tanzania in a small region called Livale. So there we had a tree height map that we recorded using these uh, laser scanning. So that formed the machine learning setup. The satellite images on one side, and we wanted to produce uh, to make tree height maps on the other side. So <coughs> we had two choices. We could I either frame this as a regression problem, and um, then we have uh, um, described the tree height as a number, the, the height of the tree. So that's what we did. But for uh, uh, illustration, I'm going to also look at classification. So I grouped the tree heights into three groups, uh, no, three below two uh, no trees below two meters, <coughs> four to seven meters, which is sort of mid-range, and then above 10 meters, which is tall trees. So we'll start off with the classification problem. So in, um, when it comes to remote sensing and satellite imagery, the tradi traditional way of doing this with machine learning is to compute some features. And the features is a way to extract information from the input data that gets you closer, closer to the output. So it should be uh, extraction of the relevant information for the problem you want to solve. And then on this feature space, we apply a classifier to divide the uh, data points. So let's go into detail about this. Well, the features, first of all, we have the raw pixel values recorded by the satellite. And these are actually contain relevant information about the forest height. Forest is green, right? So where there is green color, we have uh, probably forests. In addition, we can use physics at this step. So uh, the chlorophyll in the leaves of the uh, trees, they reflect more green light than the other wavelengths. So there is a paper on how to exploit this using satellite uh, data, and they call it the normalized difference vegetation index. So it's a ratio between the green light and uh, the red light. And there are other features like this we can compute. So in the feature step of the problem, we, we compute relevant features. We can put in prior knowledge about the problem. And uh, then we can do analysis an analysis of the features. So let's do that. We have our uh, different features here, the, the different channels. Um, and we can take one pixel from each of the channels, like this. That gives us a feature vector. 
So one of these feature vector rep represents one sample, and we want to classify the, the ground truth value for this, uh, this pixel. So if we take two of the channels, for instance, the NDVI and the, the red channel, and make a plot, we can put this pixel in the feature plot. And if we do this with all the pixels in the image, we arrive with this plot. So then we have on one axis the um, red edge color channel, and on the other axis we have the NDVI. And we also put colors on the pixels to indicate which class they are, uh, they have their ground truth value as. So now we see that uh, the three classes we have uh, uh, put up separates somewhat in this space. It doesn't look too promising, but at least the green and the blue uh, dots are separable. And this is just two of uh, the features we have plotted against each other. So we have eight features in total, and then we can have 64 of these plots. And we can play around to look at uh, which features are important and see if we, if we find features that uh, make the classes uh, separate in a better way. So <coughs> another way of doing this is to combine all the features into one plot. And we call this the PCA transform, Principal Component Analysis. So uh, the PCA transform takes all the eight channels and combines them into two uh, different components. So it's just a transformation of the feature space into a low dimensional space. And here we see the clusters separate a bit more maybe. Still, it don't look too promising. There's another uh, similar method called TSNE. So the PCA is a very simple linear transform and the TSNE is a nonlinear uh, transform. But it's more or less based on the same principle. And there we see that the pixels clusters a bit more, the classes clusters a bit more. We can also have a look at uh, the different clusters in the plot. For instance, if we take a look at this uh, cluster here, which is kind of outside of the general uh, trend, we see that that's actually the clouds in the image because the data is so different. So we can use the features and these techniques to explore the data, to learn more about uh, what the data looks like before we even start thinking about doing the classification. Okay, so let's leave that and uh, look more into how we can uh, classify, given that we have this, uh, these features. So the goal of the classifier is to divide the clusters in the feature space if we have a classification problem. If we have a regression problem, the goal is to find the trend of the points in space. So a very simple way of doing this is to find the mean values of each, the, each of the clusters, compute the statistics, the covariance, how, how wide they are, and then based on that, make a statistical um, probability of which class a pixel should belong to, depending on where it lays in the feature space. So now we have a trained classifier, and a very important part of a machine learning project is to define how to test the algorithms. So this was our uh, labeled ground truth data. Now we can either train on all the data and test on the same data. We know that the algorithm gets better the more data you have, so it might sound like a good idea, but the problem is that we d cannot trust the test accuracy. If we train and test on the same data, we don't know how the algorithm would perform on new data. Another option would be to perform cross-validation. So then we would just divide the training data in many small parts and randomly 
pick some parts for testing and some parts for training. And we would do this many times and then average the results afterwards. Now, this, in, in some cases, this uh, works well, but the problem here is that the pixels are correlated. So when two pixels lay close to each other, they tend to have the same uh, pixel values and the same ground truth value. So then the cross-validation estimate will actually be, actually be too optimistic as well. So <coughs> the best uh, solution in this case would be to divide the training data in two. And of course, uh, ideally, we should have the test data far away from the training data, but this is the best we can do with the data we have. So let's try the algorithm. Here we have some input data from the test section. We have the prediction, and we have the ground truth um, map as well. And we see that it's not very good. It captures the general trend of this uh, road or river across the image. We see that the clouds are classified as uh, low veg vegetation. So the, the yellow color is uh, 0 to 2 meters, and then the light and dark green is the taller to other classes. But it's not enough just to look at the image. Uh, we need to quantify how good the algorithm is. So typically, we can use uh, accuracy per pixel, how many pixels are correct. For this case, we had 62% in the training data and 59 in the test data. That doesn't sound very good, uh, but we need to keep in mind that random guessing is 33% if we have three classes. So it's not very good, but at, at least it's better than having no algorithm. Now we can take uh, the accuracy and break it down even more. So this is the confusion matrix. Uh, so if we, if we take the test accuracy and plot the confusion matrix, we would take the, uh, have the ground truth classes on one axis and the prediction uh, predicted classes on another axis. And then if we put the um, plot the, the prediction versus the ground truth value, we could look, see how many of the uh, pixels labeled as ground, uh, ground truth class 1 is actually predicted as class 1. And if not, what classes are it, is it then predicted as? And we do this for all the classes, obviously. So from this we see that class 1 is fairly good, 80%. Class 3 is fairly good. Uh, 87%, but the middle class, there is a lot of confusion. In addition, if, if there is one class we're particularly interested about, for instance, class 1, we can compute uh, what's known as the recall. So that's the rate of how many of the uh, class 0 pixels did you actually found. So if you're trying to uh, diagnose a disease, for instance, in a medical setting, this would be how many of the patients with the disease did you actually find with the algorithm or the test. We also have the precision, which is how many false positives do you have. So given that you have predicted class 1 for a pixel, what's the chance that the algorithm uh, made a wrong prediction? So these numbers are also... Uh, useful for evaluating the, the machine learning algorithm. So we can try uh, different more of the uh, types of classifiers. So we have the simple probabilistic classifier, which is not that often used. Uh, we have some more modern ones, a neural network, uh, random forest, and they perform better on the training set. But we see on the test set, in this case, they're performing um, about the same. So that depends a bit on, on the problem, which classifier to use. But the main problem here is that we have bad features. The features don't separate, so no matter how you try to divide the clusters, you will always make a lot of mistake. 
So this brings me to what we actually did in this project, uh, which is to apply deep learning. So in the traditional way, we had the input data, we used our knowledge about the problem to get the features, and we used machine learning to train the classifier. So in deep learning, we use machine learning to do both. So we train end to end, and for images, we typically use a convolutional neural network. So it's a neural network, but it's made out of convolutions. So if we have an image, for example, a convolutional neural network applies layers of convolutions, and it's the filters in the convolution that we try to optimize to get to the right uh, result. So we can do this as a uh, use con uh, CNNs as um, to do classification. We can do it with uh, to solve image segmentation problem. So then the input is an image and the output is an image with classes. So this is the one we will use on our forest problem. We can do object detection where the output is boxes around the objects. So deep learning, it's great if you have a lot of training data, but it comes with some warnings as well. It's very easy to overfit. So the difference between the training accuracy and the test accuracy is very often large. So we need to test it properly. It can be unreliable when applied to new data. So it may work very well on the data you have and suddenly you get new images that are taken uh, with a slight different angle or something and then it breaks down. And it's hard to explain how it works, which Peter mentioned. So, uh, for our problem, we had our uh, uh, ground truth data and we made these small crops of data. And we used the segmentation network and trained the network to give the uh, forest map as output. So when we did this with the three class setup we had, uh, we had 87% uh, accuracy. And uh, the reason we got this increase is that the convolutional neural network looks at a large, larger part of the image of the neighboring pixels, while the traditional methods in this case only look at one pixel at a time. So we take leverage of the spatial correlation between the classes. We also did this as a regression problem. So then uh, we, the output was the tree height directly, not the three classes. And uh, to, the, to your right here, we have plotted the ground truth uh, value against the predicted value on our test data. So it seems to work uh, quite well. So what we did was to apply this to all of Tanzania. And remember, we had training data only for, from a small section. Uh, it correlates well with what we see in, in the satellite image. And we also applied it to uh, entire Africa. And then we had made a um, map of the forest in Africa with 10 by 10 meter resolution. So that's 300 billion pixels or something. So again, training data were down there. Uh, we see the rainforest in Congo pops out. That's positive. Uh, we also see that Sahara now has forest, all of Sahara. So we fixed the Sahara problem. <laughs> and, and the reason for this happening is that we never trained on any images with desert in it, only images with forest. So then, as I said, deep learning, when you apply it to new data, uh, you don't know what's happening. So <coughs> this is work in progress, of course. You can actually take, uh, make one map of two years, and the Sahara, uh, Sahara effect is stationary. So if you take the difference between two years, you actually uh, remove some of this problem. But uh, in order to, to make this a uh, uh, good solution, of course, we need to have training data from 
more cases than just the red square down there. So this is just one of the projects uh, we have at NR using deep learning. I thought I would show you just uh, two or three more. Uh, another one we had was together with Riksantikvaren in Norway to detect cultural heritage sites. So uh, what we used as input data was then a hillshade image of the uh, digital elevation model. So we have uh, scannings all over Norway with how the terrain looks like, and we made this hillshade image. And what we're looking for are these um, grave mounts, Grav uh, We're looking for um, these uh, pit traps where they try to catch animals. And we're looking for uh, kulminar, places where they made coal. So we had labeled some examples. We used uh, faster RCNN, uh, deep learning algorithm, to find boxes. And we were able to identify these different uh, sites using the algorithm. And uh, they tested this in Evre Eikar Commune. And uh, I think there was about a, a thousand sites that were proposed by the algorithm. And then the next job is, of course, to go out in the forest and to verify that the, the sites are really uh, these uh, heritage sites. So they started doing that job, but they already found some new places that I didn't know about using this algorithm. And they were quite excited. So uh, next activity we're doing together with um, the Marine Research Institute in Norway is on explaining how deep learning models work. So they have this uh, problem that they're trying to tackle with deep learning. Uh, so these are um, what is called air stones, arthalids, from fish. And if you take one of these stones and divide them in two, you can, experts can tell the age of the fish by looking at these uh, rings. And they trained an uh, algorithm to to mimic the experts, and they got quite good results. So we were interested in seeing why, why did it work so well. So we used one, a method called uh, layer-wise relevance propagation. Uh, and with this method, we can take an image, and we can uh, run it through the network, and we can get out which part of the image that were important in a positive or negative direction for the model making the prediction that it made. So the plots look like the one to the right there. So if we take these plots and average them over age, like this, we see that for the fish with the young age, it's the edge around uh, the athlete that's important. But as the fish grows older, more of the attention is drawn to the middle, to the center of this autolith. So this is very, very interesting stuff. The last project uh, I'm going to talk about is one we have together with the Cancer Registry in Norway, uh, with this mammography screening program. So there we have these time series data every year or every second year. There's a new mammogram. and uh, when the doctors get a mammogram, they look at it and try to figure out whether there is risk of cancer and, and whether they should do further investigation. So we have that as ground truth data and we're trying to replicate what the doctors do. And uh, what's interesting is that the doctors sometimes can look at the image and get the gist of the cancer without uh, being able to explain why. In some cases, they can actually look at the opposite breast, for instance, and, uh, and um, often they are right about if there's cancer in the other breast. So this is a sign that there is something extra in the image. And, and combining this with the, the explainable AI that I showed you in, in the previous project is going to be very interesting. So uh, what we're trying to do here is to see if deep learning can complement the doctors. So if 
when you have a new mammogram, you could both have a doctor look at it and you ha can have the algorithm and you can make a decision based on both those predictions. So this is very interesting, but it, we just started doing it. So that's what I had. Thanks for listening. <laughs>